talking today about um, the Stoic theory of emotions, and you've read the consolations, the two consolations of Seneca that are in the textbook. But instead of concentrating directly on that work, I'm going to first give um, a sort of abstract or analytical overview of the theory, and then we can um, give concrete examples on the basis of the readings. Okay, but obviously anybody can interject at any time to clarify or even if there's something in particular you want to discuss from the reading. Okay, but um, first of all, this is one of the most important and influential areas of Stoicism. And this genre of writing, a consolation, which is a form of writing which is designed to relieve painful experiences. Uh, the Stoics are masters of, they develop this genre, and Seneca in particular is without peer. And all later consolations written in the medieval period, the Renaissance period, the early modern period, down to, to those that are still being written today, in any form, all are directly influenced by Seneca. I should say directly or indirectly, because a lot of people have other influences, but those influences come directly from Seneca. So how is it that a piece of writing or reasoning could actually relieve painful emotions. So, first of all, instead of just saying emotions, let's learn the Greek word here, which is pathé. And it has a very general application, where it means something just like any experience, or in fact, anything that happens to you. Anytime you are a patient as opposed to an agent. Okay, so literally anything that is inflicted on you uh, is a pathé. And so the immediate uh, and, and, and most radical and primitive meaning of it is something like a disease or an illness or a sickness, something that comes upon you and affects you, especially negatively. So. The term is most frequently employed in the medical lexicon and the medical literature with references to diseases that people suffer. So you can describe um, cancer or diabetes as being a pathé. You can describe manic depression and anxiety as being a pathé. One, of course, of the body, the other of the soul. But then, philosophically, the term also takes on this uh, meaning that, in a way, it stems both from this abstract and this medical use, but to mean a kind of affection, that is, a way that one is affected, and so, generally, feelings and emotions uh, of all kind. Now, the term emotion has other various technical meanings in psychiatry, psychology, and contemporary philosophy, not, of all, not all of which map on perfectly either to ancient conceptions of pathé in general or the Stoic theory in particular, but it is useful uh, to continue talking about emotions. Now, <clears throat> to give everything constructed on both sides of this handout, the side that I'm going to be dwelling on mostly today, is the one about emotions, and then on Wednesday, uh, I'll say a little bit more about uh, a general schema of virtues and vices for the Stoics. But um, everything on both sides of these handouts, I simply put together out of the textbook by Inwood. So every one of these references, you could follow up into that textbook to get more of the context uh, if you want. I just constructed my abstract account of the theory purely out of, out of those texts available to you in the textbook. 
Now, the first thing is to find a general definition of this. I mean, this is not a definition. These are just glosses of this term. These are just synonyms of this term. But they give a general definition of pate. An irrational and unnatural movement of a soul or an excessive impulse. Now, by saying that it's an irrational movement, they show the, 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 the central and most important feature of their theory, which is what we call a cognitive theory of the emotions. Essentially, the Stoics think that emotions, at least the bad ones, are problems with cognition. They're problems with how people think about things. That is, the cause of them, the cause of this kind of suffering, these kind of excessive feelings and so forth, is because people reason incorrectly. <clears throat> it's not as if people just have some other part of their soul or something that naturally feels emotions and that somehow the rational part of the soul has to try to mediate this irrational part. That's a picture that we see in Plato, in Aristotle, and in, in other ancient philosophers. The Stoics reject that. Because they don't think there is, there are parts of the soul. The soul is just a singular thing. In fact, it's a body. And uh, the causes of emotions are entirely due to this, to the rational faculty that is identical to the soul in their view. Okay, so therefore, as Chrysippus says, passions are judgment. We can define every emotion. Okay, I don't think I put passion up here, but that's another translation. Passion related to the idea of passivity or being affected, i.e. an affection as opposed to being an agent. Okay? Um, passions are judgments. Okay? Judgments are thoughts or sentences, complete thoughts or sentences, where one thing a predicate is predicated of as a subject. So that is a rational thing that requires the ability to use language and the ability to use reason. So the kinds of things that they're talking about here are not the kinds of things that animals can possibly suffer. So it might look to us like, um, like a cat is angry or sad or something, but that's just an anthropomorphic thing that we project onto them. They've got their own instincts, their own behaviors, and so forth. We just conceive of it on analogy to feelings that we have that are caused by reasoning. Now, um, so what we can do is, as in the chart here, break down between four general kinds of emotions. Okay. Uh, and remember, all these emotions are forms of suffering. So even pleasure or delight, hedony, is considered, that's something that happens to you. It's a feeling you have, an emotion you have. In the, in the Stoic view, it's a bad thing. So are desires. Desires or lusts and appetites, all of these are, are synonyms for the same phenomenon in the Stoic view called epithumia. Similarly, forms of pain, distress, loopy, these are, this, this is a class of emotions. And similarly, fear or phobos is a kind of uh, emotion. And every other, every specific kind of emotion in their theory fits under one of these four. And so I've given you definitions of a vast uh, set of emotions there. So under fear, there's not just fear, there's also dread, shame, hesitation, shock, etc. And, and pain, we shouldn't just be thinking of as physical pain. In fact, distress is probably a better translation. And it includes things like pity, grudging, envy, resentment, heavy-heartedness, congestion, sorrow, anguish, confusion. All of these have their own independent definitions and analyses in their view. 
But first we'll concentrate on the definition of the general kinds of emotions and how they are conceived of as judgments and thus as irrational movements of the soul. So take the case of pleasure. Pleasure or delight, the Stoics say, is involves a judgment that something is good which is not actually a good, and that that good is present to me. Okay? So, for example, if I think that wealth is good, and of course wealth is not actually a good, it's merely an indifferent, it can be good or it can be bad, depending on how it's used, but suppose that I'm confused, and I think that, you know, I'm one of these Ayn Rand people, and I think that wealth just is good, and I have that confusion, and then I also think that I have a lot of wealth. That's a ridiculous proposition I know for a philosophy professor to say. But suppose that I was somebody that actually had wealth. And I thought, this is really great. I'm a rich guy. Right? And I take pleasure or delight in that. Right? They would say, that is an irrational form of suffering. Okay? Now, to make that a bit more... Um, a bit more plausible, consider the analysis of uh, desire. Okay? Desire is a belief, a wrong belief that something is good, such as wealth, but a belief that I don't have it. Okay? So, uh, suppose Monty Johnson was one of those Ayn Rand people who thought that wealth really is intrinsically good, but I correctly realized that I don't have it because I'm a, pure, I'm, a, I'm a poor, starving philosophy professor. And so I have a desire for this thing that I think is intrinsically good, that I think is good by nature. I want wealth. All the cool people have wealth. Wealth makes life so much better, right? And so I want it. I desire to have it. And this desiring is a form of suffering. Right? It's something that's happening to me, and it's a feeling that I that I have. Now, again, these we could we could change any of the purported goods that aren't actually goods for uh, wealth here. So, uh, health, for example, could be something that I mistakenly think is good, and mistakenly think I have it, and so take. Or, or, or think that I have it, maybe I do have it, and then I take delight in that, or think that I don't have it, and so desire to have it. Either way, I'm suffering an irrational or unnatural movement of the mind. Now, <clears throat> pain is a case where I falsely believe that something is bad, and I believe that it is present. To me. Okay, so um, this is a, this is a definition of uh, distress, a judgment that something is bad, which is not actually a bad, and is present to me. So to make this easiest, just flip the cases I just gave you. Suppose that I think that uh, wealth um, is something. Uh, suppose I think that poverty is something bad, and I think I'm just a poor philosophy professor. I'm never going to be um, rich like these people that went on to law school and so forth. And so then I have distress about that. Again, the cause is irrational because it's just not true that wealth is something good. And were I to not think that way, I might not suffer from this um, kind of emotion. Again, um, if I think that disease, a disease like diabetes, is a bad thing, and I also think that it's present to me, that I've been diagnosed with it, and that I'm suffering from it, then I might very well be distressed about that, and that would be an irrational <coughs> form of suffering. And so the final um, category is when one has this belief that something is bad, but 
thinks that it's absent uh, uh, to them, this is the category that we call uh, fear. Okay, so um, I believe that it would be bad to die, and I think that, um, uh, and, and, and I think about this, it's not present to me now, but when I think I'm going to die eventually, I could have fear about this. Now, that would be irrational, because I'd be thinking that death is a bad thing, which of course it's not, it's just an indifferent thing, it's quite a good thing sometimes, but if I was confused and thought it was a bad thing, uh, then I might uh, fear it. Or again, sickness, poverty, uh, and so forth. And so, that's why we can break this down into a table of two by two things, is the confusion and the irrationality about uh, what's good or is it about what's bad, and furthermore, is it about something that is present to me or something that is absent from me? And it is judgments about these things that cause these forms of suffering and emotion. And so each one of the subdivisions of these general kinds of emotion involve judgments about things in particular uh, domains. So, for example, um, in the case of fear, I don't just fear, for example, death or pain or something like that. You might fear having a bad reputation, and we call that shame, and that's a negative, um, bad uh, emotion that one might suffer from. Um, and uh, hesitation, shock, etc. There's a similar story for each of these. Okay, so it is a cognitive theory because the theory is that all emotion and suffering is caused by cognition or by thoughts that we have. And uh, and so this is what makes the idea of a consolation possible. An idea that you could reason with somebody in order to relieve their suffering or distress. Now, in the form that we have it in these consolations by Seneca, we have long letters addressed to specific people. Um, in fact, they're open letters, I think, and you can you can see that by reading them. Not all of the advice even given in them would be applicable to the person who happens to be. Uh, to, to be suffering from something. So for example, when he gives the advice to Marcia, yes, I know you're suffering because um, your son died, but what, what people should do is reflect on the fact that death isn't something, uh, something bad and so forth, but they should also anticipate that everybody around them is going to die, and so that when this eventually happens, they won't be surprised by it. Well, that doesn't work very well if it's already happened. You can't anticipate that your son is going to die if you didn't do that beforehand and you're already suffering from the shock and distress because by the time it happened, you had these confused and irrational thoughts about what's good and what's bad. But the consolation need not be deployed in exactly that form. We could deploy it also in the form of a psychoanalyst with a patient on a couch that's suffering from irrational disturbances and emotions. And the idea is that the therapist can actually reason with that person, talk through the problem, find what's causing the confused thoughts that produce the emotion, and replace those with a different form of cognition. And this is essentially the idea behind what we now call cognitive behavioral therapy, and what the ancients just called therapy. We have to use terms like cognitive behavioral therapy because many of our forms of therapy now target the bodily causes of these diseases instead of the psychological causes. And so psychopharmacology is a major way to address these problems. But the, um, the, the ancients had various pharmacological solutions, but they weren't nearly as effective, so they were more dependent 
on these kind of cognitive behavioral therapies. And so the Stoics developed an enormous storehouse of them, and we see them being deployed in particular cases with respect to these particular people in Seneca's Consolations. Okay, so with that, that, that's the general theory. Now, do we want, does anybody have any questions about the general theory? Yes. To clarify, when uh, it's, a, it's a pate, yeah. you're saying how um, it has a negative connotation with the disease, illness, and sickness aspect, yeah. but it, does it overall have a negative um, connotation as well, just talking about, not that the emotions, when you use that word, refers to negative emotions, but just because the Stoics view emotion as this, this bad, kind of, or? Well, yes, it, it, it's a good question because I'm, I'm going to, get into, in a moment, what they call the you patheia, which means the actual good pathe. So there we need to translate pathe as something like feeling or something. So it turns out there actually are good affections, good feelings, even good emotions that it's possible to experience. But uh, and, and, and we're gonna and I'm gonna discuss and describe that controversial doctrine. And it's important to ask whether that doctrine is consistent with their generic account of Pathé or not, because many people accuse them of um, simply re renaming things and and uh, replacing what we all thought along, that there's good and bad emotions with this theory that essentially says emotions are all bad and we need to extricate them, but there are some feelings that we can approve of under certain circumstances. And so Cicero and other people take them to task uh, for doing a similar thing that they do with goods by saying, well, these things aren't really goods, they're indifference, but then there's indifference and there's indifference. There's preferred indifference and dispreferred uh, indifference. And so... Uh, see if you think that they're playing a similar terminological game in their account of the good emotions. But those aside, and they say much less about those than they do about the bad ones, and when they're talking about the bad ones, they don't call them something like kakapatheia, which would mean bad emotion. They just call those patheia. Okay, so if it's not modified, you can assume that it has a negative connotation, even if it just means something like feeling or emotion, it's got this intrinsic, uh, it's got this, this connotation of being something you're suffering from. Okay? Yeah, Chrissy? So would they say that like, agency is inherently good and then passivity is just bad? Is that how they would kind of define why emotions are bad or negative? Well, um, no, because it, it's inevitable that things happen to us and we suffer from things. The question is how, how that lines up with our cognition and how we think about them happening. So, so as such, pathe in the sense of disease or illness generically cannot, uh, cannot intrinsically be a bad thing. It only is in combination with how it's, it's thought about, okay? Um, and similarly, I don't think that they can say that agency in and of itself is something good, because we'll be talking about agency, you know, we think, again, to use my extremely crude false dichotomy, we're talking about the agency of Mother Teresa or the agency of Hitler, right? Agency itself isn't good. Agency is important, and, and, and hopefully the use of the term indifference doesn't doesn't get confused to make it seem like that's not an important thing, but the point is that agency can be used, can, can, can go one way or the other. And so can the, and so can passivity, okay? Things can happen to me that are good uh, or bad, but the, the, the suffering and the problem arises based on my cognition of it. Yeah, Ross. <coughs> so the stoic uh, position is that if you have the right understanding of what's good, you cannot be in pain. That seems unreasonable. You cannot be in distress. Okay. 
okay? If, if you have the right account, in this case, of what's bad, you don't think that um, the, you don't think something's bad that isn't actually bad, then you are actually immune to distress. Okay? And now, um, we have to um, distinguish between a feeling, a physical sensation in the body, and a full-blown emotional state. Okay? And so, um, take, take a case like um, anger, and suppose that I'm made angry by some outrageous act of hubris where somebody um, comes, comes up and punches me that it, randomly on the street. Okay, well then, there is a point where I suffer, in a sense, and am pained by the blow that hits me. But when that blow hits me, and I feel that, and I'm a patient, and I suffer this, that, that necessary uh, affection, okay? Because Stoics don't, it's not that they um, uh, completely anesthetize themselves from feeling anything. They still feel that initial thing. Then the question arises about an assent to a certain proposition. So then the... Um, thought occurs to me that this pain I'm feeling is a bad thing. Or, this pain that I'm feeling is something I should be indifferent to. Now, in the latter case, you know, that was, that was painful, that, that sucked, but I don't really care. I don't let things like that bother me. I don't let things that are out of my control not only hurt me in that way, but then hurt me even worse on a mental level where I become emotional or angry about it. So the, the former, the initial, the initial impact, okay, and the initial, and we have to call that a feeling or something, that cannot be eliminated or extirpated, okay? But the judgment about it, the, the axiological consideration of whether it's good or bad, that is completely up to me and in my, in my power, in my control. And um, this, of course, is the crucial moment of our agency, is what we give assent to. And so then the actual suffering from the emotion of anger, okay, um, or, or distress, uh, that is up to me. And so I think that, that um, it's a bit provocative that the term loopy, which really does mean pain, although there are, there are other words for pain in the Greek language. There's even more in the Roman language. It's crazy. You know, they, just like they have thousands of extra words for how to kill people, they also have lots of extra words for pain. It's kind of a, hopefully that's just an accident of which of our texts have survived. But um, <laughs> this is a kind of theme in ancient literature, anger, and pain. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, I think the phenomenon, as far as we're talking about an emotion and emotional suffering, um, is, is actually about distress, okay? Whether, if, 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 if I um, assent to the idea that this pain I'm suffering in my foot because I have a horrible case of gout, or like Epicurus because I've got um, painful kidney stones or something. Um, you, the, the, the Stoics, no more than anyone else, has no means of eliminating that, those initial feelings. I had to wait until psychopharmacology got good enough to deal with it on that level. Okay, they can't eliminate that, but there's an added emotional response to pain. And I think, I think people have seen this. We know people that deal better and worse with pain. And there are people that not only experience pain, but experience distress at the fact that they're experiencing um, pain. And then this can also uh, enlarge into fears about, about greater pains and so forth. And you get this kind of cycle of emotional disruption. And all of that is irrational in their view. But we certainly need to um, 
I mean, it's a good point. You're working on the theory of pleasure and pain in, in um, Epicureanism and utilitarianism for your, for your research paper. So we have to see that, to some extent, there's a different definition of both pleasure and pain going on here than we find in the Epicureans. And the focus is on the cognitive part of pleasure and pain, the thoughts we have about pleasure and pain. And because those we can actually do something about. We can relieve people's suffering or their irrational bliss and so forth by helping them to reason better and, and using consolations and psychoanalysis and that sort of thing. Um, the other things we either can't do anything about or we leave to psychopharmacology. Okay, so any other questions or thoughts just about the general theory? Yeah. You said previously for the stoic don't believe that we can classify the emotions of animals, right? So their emotional spectrum. Well, they don't they don't believe that animals have emotions in this sense. But because they, they don't have Cognition and all of these problems are caused by cognition. In the letter, he reads his whole, um, like how natural it is for a person to grieve about what they see based on his observation of animals. And yes. That's only you point to me. Yes. So um, that's right. He he consoles Marcia by saying, "You've been grieving for too long. We should look at how uh, animals, once they've become upset, they." grieve only so long and then no longer. I think that's a great example of um, Seneca not sticking to the orthodox representation of Stoic theory, as he says that he doesn't. We, we, we looked at the passage in On Tranquility of the Soul where he says, I'm going to diverge from this view, even so far as to accept certain Epicurean ideas sometimes. It raises an enormous problem about the coherence of his philosophy with itself and with Stoicism. That, I think, um, makes... What, what's interesting about that piece of advice is that... Um, is the way it resembles a kind of oikiosis or cradle-like argument, that we can look at how irrational animals or infants behave before they become confused by cognition. And then we can take that as an indication of how we ought to live in accordance with nature. And so the idea is that we ought to live more like these animals do in accordance with nature, not suffering, or not, sorry, not uh, grieving for extended periods of time. But the fact of the matter is that they don't grieve, they don't suffer, they don't have cognition. None of this therapy could possibly work on them because they cannot possibly be reasoned with. Okay, so in, in a technical sense, there is a disanalogy between the two, and, uh, and, and one might argue that this advice misleads one into thinking that emotions are more like the kinds of things that, that animals suffer, when, that, when their, their doctrine cannot uh, permit that. I mean, animals clearly do suffer pain, Okay, and uh, pleasure. I mean, you can do experiments on your own pets. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can easily show that they can experience pain in the sense that Rawson was wondering if the Stoics were really claiming they can eliminate pain like that. There's no question about that. But what animals don't seem to suffer, and this is part of Seneca's point, is a further distressed cause by not only having the bad feeling, but thinking that the feeling is something bad in a moral sense, right? And you, you add distress and you add pain on top of something that's inevitable by the way that you're thinking about it. Whereas humans, so, so, this is, so these emotions basically are things that, ways that humans screw up their lives that animals can't possibly do. I mean, this is a problem with this wonderful ability to use language and to reason, is that it sometimes goes wrong, and then people end up making themselves suffer because they're, they're doing it wrong. And animals have neither the advantages of being able to reason and use language, but they also don't have
have these disadvantages. So if, 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 we, if we interpret that as like a kind of cradle argument, then it, 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 it in theory can make some sense, but it doesn't, but insofar as it suggests that animals are suffering similar kinds of things as what he's trying to relieve there, then, um, uh, then it is a misleading characterization. Okay, but uh, that's a good point. Now, let, let me talk for a second about the approved emotions, the, the so-called eupatheia, because corresponding to three of the four um, kinds of bad emotion are forms of good emotion that they say it's legitimate to experience. So the first, and I, and I put these in parentheses in small type um, next to each of them. So in the case of goods being present to one, if I have a correct cognition, I think something is present to me and I think that it's good, then I might experience joy about it. So suppose that um, I think that courage or temperance, I think both of those are, a, are, are quite a stretch in my own case. Wisdom? Uh, no, not that either. But um, suppose I think that courage is a good thing, and I rightly believe that I'm courageous. Well, then it would be legitimate for me to experience joy in response to that rational thought. Now, joy is supposed to be a fairly low-grade thing that's perfectly consistent with you know, the stoic who never changes his facial expression and so forth, experiencing it. And we're supposed to have the idea of a nice, controlled, under-control emotion as opposed to irrational delight and exuberance in something that I irrationally think is good and that I think is present to me. Now, in the case of a good being absent, okay, so suppose I, somebody give me an example of something that is good and really is good and that is absent to them, but that, and so that one could have a wish for it, and this wish, wish would be a legitimate feeling. Yeah, wrong. Intelligence? Okay. Um, right, so... If I um, rightly think that intelligence is a good thing, um, and I rightly think I don't have uh, intelligence, then it is fully rational for me to experience, to have the affection or the passion that, wow, I really wish I was intelligent. And this could motivate me to do something like show up to school, and get further education, and things like that. And that, that would appear to be fine. And that is very different from lusting after things and having irrational appetites uh, towards them. Now, the third category um, of approved uh, emotion is caution. So somebody construct for us the counterpart to fear. What, 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 would, what would it be rational to have a caution? about. Okay, Robert. Uh, say, uh, knowing to avoid doing things that are unjust. So it's not to violate Okay, for, for example. Uh, not murdering someone just for funsies, because that would be unjust. Okay, so suppose I have the view that murdering innocent people is a bad thing. That's presumably correct. Um, and yet, I have this kind of impulse to go out and murder some innocent people, then I might validly experience caution that says, wait, maybe I shouldn't just go out and, and, and do that, okay? I was thinking something more like um, 
uh, intemperance or something, where I think that it would be bad if I were to overindulge in alcohol too early in the day, and yet I'm tempted to head to the pub right after um, class. And so, but I've got a stoic way of looking at this. I realize that would be a bad thing, so I'm cautious and I take steps to avoid uh, avoid walking by the pub so that that temptation will occur to me or something like that. Okay. Now notice that there is no um, no legitimate emotion, no good emotion, no good feeling that corresponds to the bad feeling of distress or pain when something bad is present. Now, can you, can, can anybody think of why they, so this, this looks like a strange thing in their theory, they just don't have anything in that category. Why not? Why is there not an approved emotion in that particular category? Well, you and I are having a dialogue today. <laughs> um, I guess because bad things um, being present are necessarily irrational. Uh, the only things that are rational are the, are the virtues, which are the only which are good, right? Okay, but couldn't I legitimately think something is bad and think that it's present to me? Well, I think they do have some things that are bad. These little things called vices. Oh, right. Like being unjust, being intemperate, being cowardly, being unwise, foolish, stupid. All those are really bad things. Okay, but there's no emotional state that can correspond to that because, well, the easiest way to think of it is imagine the condition of the sage. The sage doesn't have any bad things present to him, because the only things that are truly bad are vices, but a sage doesn't have any vices, because the sage thinks correctly about these things. So there is no, there is no possibility of experiencing something good in that category. It doesn't occur to the one who has their emotions under control and has a rational way of thinking about these things. So to a person that's purely rational, there are no present things that are truly bad in the strict axiological sense of their ethical theory. Okay, and similarly, the approved eupatheia, or good feelings, admit of several different kinds, and each of these has its own definition and so forth. So in which we can have rational appetency, goodwill, kindness, acceptance, contentment, all of those are perfectly legitimate and all of those have their own different individual objects that involve me correctly evaluating the goodness or badness of that thing and me correctly understanding whether or not it is present to me. And similarly for caution, rational avoidance, respect, and sanctity. You know, caution is how Stoics avoid getting into a condition like Pyrrho or something where you don't even exhibit caution towards oncoming cars or when you're walking over on the cliffs. Yeah? Um, is it possible like for like for something that is bad, which is bad and is present, like for example, say, I don't know, I'm, uh, I'm not wise, like, I'm not, I don't have wisdom, like, like, isn't it possible, like, we can have a proper judgment in that, like, I want to be wise? Yeah, and that's called <coughs> wish. That, that's where wisdom is not present to me, okay, so it's absent to me, and it is something good. And I correctly judge all of those things. So, so having a wish to be wise is a is a legitimate 
and fully rational emotions that I hope all of you are constantly experiencing. So in that respect, like the judgment has to be in fact, notice notice that it would be there would be a problem of not experiencing that. It would be a sign of stupidity or irrationality if you didn't have that wish to become wise. It would mean either that you didn't realize that wisdom was a good thing, or what's even worse, you were confused and thought that good thing was present to you when it actually isn't. Okay, so these aren't just just happy, good emotions to have. These are things that the sage necessarily has, and that if you're doing well and living correctly, you necessarily experience this kind of joy and wish and that sort of thing. So in this example, like for example, like that judgment is on the wisdom itself, not the the vice of like not having wisdom. Okay, well let's take the vice of not having wisdom, which we also call, you know, foolishness or, or uh, ignorance or stupidity. I mean, there's a bunch of varieties of these, and trust me, the Stoics have, have definitions of each of them, okay? Um, so, um, ignorance. Now, suppose that ignorance is a bad thing, we agree that it is, and suppose that it's present to me. Okay, well then, I necessarily suffer pain uh, and distress about that. Or no, I don't, right? Because pain and distress are caused by something irrational, whereas that set of thought seems to be rational. Right? Ignorance is present to me and it's something bad. Okay? So, it looks, it looks like there isn't, there isn't an approved emotion that corresponds to that conjunction of rational thoughts. That, that has to be translated according to a logic of opposites into the um, absent thing that would be good. Wisdom. And the fact that it's absent to me instead of its negation, ignorance, being present to me. Okay. Now, I mean, that's there is a rough and ready solution to the problem, but I don't I don't know if if if, if you're getting at the idea that there's something more deeply problematic about how they they've set these up. That kind of asymmetry would suggest that there might be, because this should this should all symmetrically work out in theory, right? Yeah, Robert. In the extreme. Does the sage not experience any wishes because they've achieved everything that's good? Well, Do no, I think I think they I think they that it's still rational for them to wish for certain things. Um, I mean I think I I, I I I like the thought experiment you're setting up. The sage already has everything that's good because by virtue of being a sage, they are rational and have all of the and by virtue of being rational, have all of the virtues. Therefore, all of the virtues are present to them. None of them are absent. And therefore, um, there doesn't seem to be any rational appetency there. Now, um, except things like goodwill, kindness, acceptance, contentment, that's where we have to see what those things really mean, and if there's a sense there, there, of course, is a sense in which the sage um, has goodwill, or might, um, you know, uh, might think that things could be improved in society and other people and so forth. And they, they might, they might, they might um, want that. Again, I, mean, I think that's kind of problematic because it's focusing on things outside of your control, exposing yourselves to fortune and that sort of thing, and so. They have to be really careful here. I think it's a good question, though, that again raises questions about the coherence of, of, of the theory. Okay, but this this theory is the background of the idea that you can relieve people's suffering by reasoning with them. Yeah. Um, so if the sage is like constantly acting virtuously, would they constantly be in a state of joy? Yes. Yes. 
That is, that's the idea. So, did, who, who wrote on the ancient art of stoic joy? The William Irvine book? Right. So, that's part of this, is that you really enjoy being a stoic. If you, if you reach that, cer certainly if you reach that stage, you're just constantly experiencing joy. That person has a constant experience of joy. They know what's good. They know it's present to them. It's completely steady. It's not going anywhere, and so forth. And that, that's the essence of joy, to, to, to believe rightly that you have everything that's good.